uh, NYB, thank you so much for coming back. Episode 146 of the Minding Your Business podcast, entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's no business like minding your own. I'm your host, Champ Ron. I'm excited today um, for our guest, but as I've been opening the last several podcasts, I, I, my shout out and wishes go out to those of you that have been impacted by the current pandemic. Again, we will get through it together. Okay, that's a little foreign, I think, for some of us in this country. We have to do it together. No blue and red. Doesn't matter how you look in the mirror. Um, this is a human condition, a human being condition. Man versus virus. It's been going on since the beginning of time. We will get through it together, and then there will be life post-pandemic at whatever point that comes. In the meantime, now is a great time to dig into your business. It's a great time to dig into your skill set. And it's a great time to dig into uh, time with your family and really getting that quality time in that you may have missed or may not have valued quite as much um, prior to the pandemic. And so it's impacted us all. Shout out to everybody that's on the front lines, first responders, college students, um, you know, our elderly and senior population. You know, so let's just be good um, for ourselves, be good for our families and be good for our communities, okay? And if we can do that, we will get through this together and there's going to be great life and great times on the other side of it, uh, I can assure you. So again, I'm excited about today's guest, John Matheson, who joins me uh, from his company Leverage and he's got a phenomenal uh, company. You can uh, check it out at Leverage Calc. So that's L-E-V-E-R-A-G-E-C-A-L-C.com where you can learn more about the business that we're going to talk about some today and some other things. But John, thank you so much. I know uh, weather's uh, a bit of an issue where you are, but I appreciate you toughing it out and joining here on the Mind Your Business podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. And and your intro is awesome. And, and you know, it's with all of us home-based, right? You, me, yeah. home-based, and we talk about what things we can control and what we can do. So we're all on Zoom, right? Yeah. So, so I always say this in, the, in anything I do these days, even though I own the tech company, I don't own Zoom, right? Right. So if something goes wrong in the middle, it's just, and, and all of us with dogs, I mean, mine are compartmentalized, right? But if there the delivery go. guy shows up, you'll hear them. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. And mine, uh, my American Cocker Spaniel that's three years old now, he's got his little ball. And if it rolls underneath something or it squeaks, uh, yep. you may hear that. So we'll hear that, too. It's all good. Yeah. So it's yeah. all. Yeah, it is all good. But speaking of all good, um, John, share, you know, with us, you know, a little bit about your background. Um, understand that, that you started in real estate prior to getting into uh, technology and so we'd love I to did. hear a little bit more about you and how you got your start this is what happens like when you get to be my age and you're you actually have a resume of some substance it's kind of funny you know and you sit there and you look at <laughs> things that you've done and then somebody says well where did you start and it's like ooh, that was a while ago that was the yeah. 80s right <laughs> um so i um got i ended up with a finance degree and got placed down on wall street and I was actually down in Wall Street in the 80s when Reagan was in his second term. <laughs> there you go. Fun time. There you go. So when you project now, for me, when I left there, I went into my own company and I started as a real estate investor. So I have now been through three recessions in my career. The one in 1991 yeah. that kind of started in 89. And then there was the one that was in 01. Okay. And then there was the one, the financial crisis in 08 and 09. And now we're, and, and I would come on shows, champ, and I'd say, okay, I don't want to come back and tell people how I got through the first three, right? Because right. who I don't want to talk about the fourth, right? And up until a month ago, we wouldn't have had this conversation, but now here we are, right? Exactly. So at some point, they will get into how do we get through the fourth, right? I mean, our balance sheet grew every year through recessions. How did we do that? And it's funny because when I started, like you think about, I was in my late 20s okay. when I went out on my own and I just had this fascination that it was going to be so cool to sign my own paycheck. Sure. You know, it's like, ooh, this will be great. I'll make out my name and then I'll sign the back. back and this right. is fun and easy. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that work out, right? Right. And, and I was listening to one of your guests and one of your other shows say, you know, a lot of times a business owner doesn't get paid and boy, is he right. Yeah. You know, and you, you realize that early. That everyone else gets paid and you don't. And then you realize it's it's a grind and it's serious. And now you have to really learn some skills. Yeah. 
And exactly. my first transaction was small. I mean, I, I only had to work with what I had the ability to save between 22 and 28. So, I mean, it wasn't a lot. And so my first transaction, I think, was for $30,000, where I bought a building lot and partnered with a builder to build a house and then split the profits. And these are things you could do back in the 80s and 90s. Oh, and, 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 you know, but, but things that had such a different pace than today. The cell phone was mounted in the vehicle back then. It wasn't in your hand like it is today. And email wasn't a thing, you know, it just wasn't something that you did or texting. It was so the dynamic of businesses have changed so much to where we get to today. But along the way, and this will just segue into how we, we got into the software, along the way you learn if you want to level up, you have to have a legitimate finance source. Right. Somebody has to back you on the private side or on the commercial side. And for me, I learned early that I needed to get into credible commercial banking space. Sure. So I was meeting the you, right? And when you were in commercial banking and I, and I needed to develop those relationships and I did. Okay. And the bankers, my first start was really, it's funny because I, I listened to Bernie Marcus talk about how he starts Home Depot when the banker gave him a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, and he says, I never would have gotten that today. And I sit there and the banker gave me $220,000 in the early nineties, you know, and I never would have gotten that today. Yeah. The same way, you know, I walked in, I had a presentation book. I had everything done the way the normal business was done. And the banker was like, you know, I'll, I'll risk it on you. I'll give it to you. So when you did that, John, what, you know, what were you just in your overall profile? Had you been in business for some time? Did you have revenues? Did you have pretty solid credit profile? You know, you know, walk us through and kind of unpack that for us. I, you know, I was I'm sure I had some of that, but it, it wasn't like I had the experience behind me to get it. It yeah. was back in the day, though, where you could still do handshake banking. There you go. And probably by when you got into it, that it ended. Right. right. Oh, yeah. But in the early 90s, we could, there was still some, they would call them relics, but the old school banker was still around. You could walk in and the guy had signing authority up to a number. Right. His institution. And he, he, you know, if he liked what you were doing, they'd give it to you. You had to find them. And then, yeah. you know, things changed and then the regulations came in and sure. they were all out. And, and so, which is probably in some ways is for the better because it's better to, you know, have some accountability in the banking space, especially yeah. after 08. Yeah. But back then it was ways that you could do stuff that you can't today. But what you learn and stuff, you know, guys, years in my age still know how to do is that in-person business. Yes. Because we didn't, I didn't have, I mean, today, if, if someone texts me an offer on one of my properties, I just, you know, no, if you, right. well, you meet me in person, right? Right, 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 right. there's still some business that needs to be conducted face to face. Exactly. So I will always tell the younger kids that will mentor, this is where we started. It really was signed, sealed and delivered on a contract because there were three copies. There was no fax. There was no PDF. There was, you had a white and a pink and a canary or, you know, yell, whatever. And you right. handed it out to everybody. You really did deliver it or they didn't have it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Exactly. No, exactly true. It's right. funny so, how all that changes over. I mean, well, just how quick it did. But we, 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 we save so much time. Yeah. Once you get into the technology, I mean, I remember you'll laugh at this. When my first cell phone got mounted, I had an old, one of those old, I say old, but it was an original Jeep Cherokee. And those were one of the first four wheel drive, four door vehicles that you could right. get. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and we had, this is the nineties. We had developments open that were all dirt. So I'm like, Oh, I need four wheel drive. I'm going to be cool. Right. So it's, you know, until you bury it to the axle and realize it's not indestructible. <laughs> right, right, right. But my cell phone went into the vehicle and then all of a sudden I was so much more productive. Yeah. And my first cell phone bill came in the first month and it was $1,100. Whoa. Whoa. 1992, <laughs> say. Right. Imagine right. now today, that's what 3000, right? right? So, and, yeah, and, and I remember <laughs> champ taking the checkbook out and happily writing that check. Yeah. Because it was technology that we didn't have that made us so much more efficient. Sure. So what's that worth? Yeah. 
And then after paying that for a few months, it was like, hang on, I got to get a better price. Right. <laughs> right, right. Or I got to cut back. I mean, just gonna, <laughs> this is going to stop a little bit. Right, but it was, right. Um, but it was like, oh, I can do this from here. I don't, because we were all payphone driven. Right, of so course. So you walk around with a roll of quarters, and it wasn't for laundry in college. It was for payphones. It's for payphones, right, and beepers mm-hmm. and all that, yes. So as we, as as half the audience laughs at all of us old guys here talking about this stuff, right? Right. But that is how it was. And now today, <laughs> it's like we rock because we can do, we can do both. Right, exactly. Transition but, through both. But do you think, John, we've lost a little bit of, like you mentioned, some of the touch? I would agree with that. I think with all the technology that we've got, um, I, my personal philosophy – with technology has always been it should not eliminate the human to human contact it should more support it um it so it, it should not replace it um what it should do is take care of the mundane tasks those everyday mm-hmm. mundane tasks so that we can get to the meat of the relationship yeah. building yeah and i think sometimes we lose sight of that and one of the things i loved about with your company is your company does just that it it helps bankers and it, and it helps connect the banker to you know the borrower to help edify the community by mm-hmm. taking care of some of those routine um, type of activities that then allows for the relationships to be built right and I think sometimes that gets gets missed I mean like you mentioned I started in banking in 2002 which was after mm-hmm. um, those kind of handshake you know yeah. deals this was when centralized underwriting was coming about and you know, banks went to this cookie cutter model of, you know, we don't have to train bankers anymore. We could just stick a kid out there that just says, oh, fill out the application. And that's the only yeah. thing he, he or she does. Yeah. You know, well, what about my cash flow? Oh, fill out the application. You know, yeah. what about my business? I got these products. Oh, fill out an application. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so here we are it's with stay at home orders. Yes. Here which we means are. You and I can't shake hands. Right. Right. And we can't do business in person unless we're six feet apart and there's right. only a X number of people in the room. Right. So the challenge is when we open back up, what do we do? Yeah. We can't just, can we do the same thing on the zoom? Probably not. Yeah. So, not. you know, eventually we're going to have to get back to where we can conduct business in person again to be effective. Yeah. And how do we do that safely? And, you know, we're not going to solve that in the barbershop today. Right. right? right. <laughs> but, and it's you know, above my pay grade, but it's still an issue. It's going to be an issue for all of us on how we actually come out of all this. So for today, we communicate this way and we can sure. use the technology to stay afloat. Yeah. Which Absolutely. I like, which I like, but, I but it. yeah, it'll get to a point where we have to, we have to get out there. Yeah. No doubt about it. My guest today, John Matheson with Leverage. Um, John, now you, you shared with us about your background. How did leverage come about? I mean, sure. you're, you're in real estate, you know, you're kind of blowing and going through that. That's some shift to go from, you know, kind of real estate into the tech space, mm-hmm. uh, particularly at the time that you did so. So, you know, unpack that for us. Yeah. So that's funny. So imagine creating an elevator script when you're a real estate developer and a software developer. Yeah. Right. What do you say? How do you do that? And one it's you know, so my wife has it best. She just says, Well, it keeps him out of my hair all day. There you go. <laughs> right? Which is, which is, is, is easy shout enough. Out to her. It, it is a shout out to her. And it's like you say, everything we do is for family. So yeah. it's 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 a case of yeah. So with leverage in the two thousand eight and nine era, we were getting to the point before all of it, just I won't go back through the glorious history of all that, but before everything went down, mm-hmm. there was, you could sense there was some issues in the credit markets. Yeah. You could feel it. You know, there were people who we had some properties open and some of them were residential houses and people were coming in with pre-approvals from banks across, you know, from you're in Connecticut and you're getting a pre-approval from a Wisconsin lender. Right. You go, what is this? Yeah, You know, how the heck is this? No income verification sounds fun, but how do you do it and get a $400,000 house when the job profile that you're telling me you do pays 40000 right? Right. So, I mean, it's like you could kind of see this stuff coming. And we would put our packages together and go in for commercial lending. And one of the lenders that we worked with said to me, you know, I wish everybody would bring me the package that you do. Yeah. Because you're so organized with it. Yeah. I didn't think much of it then until then everything hit the fan. 
And so you had that, the complete, the credit market changed so much in by 2009 sure. for what was available. And we had two projects that were open and one of them had started and I needed financing and it was a legitimate finance package. It was not small capital, it was a lot. And we were one of three companies that got a loan for acquisition and development that year from this lender. Okay. So I, re I realized there was something in the packaging. So there was nothing that made me special other than maybe how I was putting in the information to the banker. And so how was that happening? So when you're sitting around through some recessionary environments, you don't have as much to do sometimes. So it's like, let's create assets that we can use on the other side. So I started to look for seamless ways to be able to com communicate with lending. And a few years went by and I had a commercial lender sit with me. Okay. And, and he and I together took what he had, which was some legacy software he was using to communicate intake of borrower information to lenders. Yeah. And we said, you know, we've got to bridge the gap between borrowers and lenders. Because okay. coming out of that financial crisis, there was a certain amount of distrust between the two parties. Yes, there was. A borrower unsure what lender was going to do. Lender saying borrower is just not prepared or doesn't have realistic expectations about what I can do. Yeah. So let's not communicate. Exactly. Well, so hence FinTech got born. Is that right? Yep. Because now it's like if the banker is not going to be reliable, maybe I can just put my information online. Well, for a credible borrower, FinTech is scary. Yeah, because, when, you know, think about it. You just sit there, you work hard for your business, you work hard to get a decent credit score, you have some assets, and somebody says, hey, upload all that through the internet into my portal, and I'll send it around to banks, and then I'll get back to you as to if anybody wants to do business with you. Right. And you just say, what? Yeah, it's what not going to happen, is, dude. I'm right. not doing that. There's just no way. So it's it, it for us, it was how do we how do we do this? to be able to take what we're doing and then get it into the cloud so that everybody has an opportunity to use it. Yeah. And so sometimes as you read a decent business, a lot of times the things that I like are when you're doing it because you can help other people. Yeah. Not just you're trying to make money. Right, exactly. You know, oh, I'm here just to sell this. No, it's like this is, this is the type of thing that maybe changes the conversation maybe changes behavior. You know, what is it that Kennedy said? We're here to influence history, not merely observe it. Yeah. And so you get a little older and you say, these are reasons why I come to work. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and so what can we give people that's a different kind of tool that they don't have that can change the outcome for them for the better in their business? Yeah. And so that's how, that's how it started. That's how it started. And I'll, now I'll tell you, when you start to develop software, Mm -hmm. and you haven't done it before and you want to take something from an excel program and put it in the cloud right, right. and you you think it's it's budgetable right? <laughs> you <sit there. laughs> right right you say oh i can do this this isn't that hard and then you start seeing people creating hundreds of thousands of lines of code mm -hmm. and then you start getting invoice and it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to do and you right. go oh wow i didn't see this coming Right. Yep, exactly. And so the budgets are blown apart and it costs five times what you think. And it just makes me laugh like when they were doing the Affordable Care Act website. Right. You know, and they came back and it was six hundred and fifty million to build that or something. And I remember scoffing at that. And then they're doing mine and with the software and, and it's like the numbers aren't anywhere near that, but they're going up and I'm like, We're not getting there. We're not getting to that number, guys. You're gonna have to do it for less. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so, but then you ultimately get it and you're like, this is cool. And that's what you see today at leveragecop.com is the result of all of that trial and error and sweat and, and extended capital that goes into something that then gets you a tool that's usable by everybody who's looking to go for financing, but feels the same way that all of us did. I mean, you were the banker. Right. right. So you may or may not have understood the psychology and emotion on the borrower side. Sure. But here's how all of us looked at you, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere between a little bit of trepidation. Sure. Of what you were going to do. And you're a great guy. 
right? But somewhere between, so you got to do this for me, all the way to absolute dread right. of the process. Yeah, right exactly. now you wouldn't know that looking at most of us because we'd come in proud, right? But right. we're looking at you going, "Oh man, what's he gonna do? Yeah, I need what this guy." Yeah, exactly. Right? Oh, is you're he, exactly you know, right. Yeah, because they took the decision making away from the people we were meeting. Right. In the '90s, like I said, there was that guy, and I knew he could sign up to a certain amount. Right. And if I went over him, I had to go to the board, and you know what I'd say to him? Let me go to the board and present. Back then, they might. You might yeah. be able to go do a board presentation today. Of you say to anyone, I want to go to forget it. So right. now it's about how do I get without having the anxiety and without time and money trying to shop to meet you? Mm -hmm. How do I get you information quickly that you can absorb in one minute or less and tell me if I'm likely to go? Yeah. I can't do the pitch anymore. I'm not meeting you in person the same way. We're yeah. in Zoom, right? We're trying to conduct business. We have to do stuff. Maybe we're on the phone. So that's what leverage is. Yeah. The, the result of the leverage software is in five minutes or less, I can input my request for a credit line, mm -hmm. credit card or business loan. Or if I'm in commercial real estate, I can give you my numbers for any cash flowing property. Sure. And I can send you a leverage report, which is a one page document, which is consumable by you as the banker sure. in one minute or less for you to tell me if I'm likely to go at your institution. So then, John, if I'm the banker, if I'm the bank, am I purchasing this software from you to then use on for my front line no. bankers? No. Okay. So you, you, as the borrower, you want the independence. Sure. I want to be able to sit at home and I want to be in my home office or I want to be at my workplace on my computer, mm -hmm. purely confidential, confidential, sure. input my numbers, sanity check myself. <laughs> and then the software says, I'm yes, I'm, I'm a go. So okay. picture that, picture me now. I already know I'm a go before I talk to you. Right. That's the dynamic change, right? That's the empowerment play that our software allows you to have as a borrower. Because mm -hmm. I know what you're going to say before you say it versus now, is me that having. Based, is that based, John? I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, is that based, off. John, on um, the bank's underwriting criteria? So yeah. are you able to then um, have some kind of communication with the banks to understand that? Or is this more of a general, you know, for example, from a, a commercial lending standpoint, um, you're calculating things like debt service and you know, yeah. all that type of thing that would be yeah. fairly standard amongst mm -hmm. underwriting guidelines. Right. You know, the only thing that may be different is maybe their loan to value requirements or carve outs. You know, yeah. So yeah. those things that can fluctuate from institution to institution. Right. For the most right. part, it sounds like you're the things that are pretty standard, you're calculating for um, the, the individual owner so that they can walk in with a report that says, all right, uh, you know, you know, you guys, you clowns, you know, I'm prepared, I'm ready to go. So you yeah. can't BS me when you start right. coming back saying, you know, I'm at a 1.1, a, a you know, debt service coverage when I'm really at a 1.4 because yeah. I've already done the calculation. And I think, right. like you say, it takes away the trepidation and the, the concern that the borrower has, and it gives them some power too, because I know, you know, as I was getting into banking and coming out of the one page document, you know, up to 50,000, you, you know, you know, wink, wink, you make, you know, 180,000 at Kroger, right? You know, yep. <laughs> um, you know, stocking shelves, nothing against right. stocking shelves, but you no. probably don't make 180K a right. year, right? So once we came out of that kind of stuff, and then it went to the other extreme, like you mentioned, John, where the banker could just be, I mean, it might as well be your, your dog or your kid. I mean, mm -hmm. all they did was they were just a middleman or woman that took your information send it to a guy or girl, probably likely in another city or another state, waited mm -hmm. for them to then say yes or no, and then communicate that back with you as the borrower. And if that wasn't favorable, a lot of those folks, you'd never get a call back from. Right. They just right. ghost you because they don't want to have, they don't want, they can't answer your questions. Right. Right. And so they don't know. That, yeah, they don't know. So there's no value in that relationship because. And they, and they don't want to tell you no. I mean, yeah. you were a banker. Who did you enjoy telling no to? Yeah, nobody. Nobody. And all any bankers tell us that. So our banker friends always want to meet our leverage customer. 
because they're a, they're a pre-qualified entity coming through. So the bankers tell us, again, like we mentioned before, the problem they have is people come in unprepared or, or just with unrealistic expectations. Yeah. And they view the software as preparing them more. Yeah. So like conversations that you would have, right? When I come in and I want my $50,000 line, and it's like, you'd say to me, well, what for? And then you want to have, you want to dive into my cash flow. Yeah. Well, I've already done that with the leverage report. So I'm going to hand that to you. Now, I already know you're going to ask more questions. Sure. I know you're going to deep dive because that's your job. And you're right. going to have, and we all know you're going to need to trust but verify data. Sure. So tax returns, finance, they're all part of the program with banking. We, we all know that. So yeah. at least we, but if we start the conversation differently, where you see the numbers coming in, Right. And you see that the borrowers actually used a third party software to prepare themselves for you. Yeah. You were the banker. You vest a little more in that file and that person. Yeah. And now well, if I have some issues, maybe you'll help me. Yeah. Well, you there's, say, a, yeah. there's a proactive nature to that. And like you say, it takes away the trepidation also on the banker side of am, am I fishing in the right pond? If, you know, what, what recommendations can I make to this guy or girl? you know, about their business or, or is it going to take all this ramp up time where I've got to, you know, get squeeze, you know, blood out of the turnip to try to get all right. this information just to find out that it's not, you know, it's not there. So I, I think it, it, like you said, it, it removes some barriers from what I see that impede the relationship, which is what you and I were talking about in the beginning. Mm. The yeah. whole thing of people coming together is to build a relationship so that your banker is part of your team, right. that they're a trusted advisor Right. You know, and someone that, you know, again, you have some confidence in and you have some trust in that if I go to him or her, they can deliver. Right. And then, you know, of course, vice versa. And so then right. that person is not only on your team, but then John is an advocate for your business. They'll defend your business to, you know, the right. a-holes up, you know, for the right off that yeah. may say, why are we giving another loan to John or why are we doing yeah. this with this company? And that person can articulate not just their emotion. I was saying, oh, well, John's a great guy. Well, yep. gr yes, but then, you know, Ron, the banker can say, oh, because, you know, uh, in calculating John's cash flow, he's at a 2.2. You know, normally yeah. we're looking at a 1.25. He's more than twice, you right. know, from a cash flow. So we're, we're well capitalized with him. Um, right. Perform very well. So that banker with confidence can, you know, give that information yep. upstream. And then that just makes for a better relationship. And we don't know in software. I mean, that's the thing. Software can be just very closed with sure. whatever you tell it is all it knows. Right. So we, we never are going to know what your balance sheet is. Mm -hmm. That's up to the banker to ask. Right. In, in a business scenario, you and I are talking just up front. The conversation opens based on cash flow. Sure. Did I turn a profit last year? Am I turning a profit so far this year? Yes or no? Yeah. We both know no means regulated institutions may not be able to lend to us. Right. So now we're into non-bank lenders, which there are plenty. Of course. Right? But these are things that you can learn. It was interesting, Babson College did a study and they had maybe a thousand business owners that they looked at and they trailed them through their financing process. And the borrowers were getting like 40 to 50% of what they asked for, the ones that got approved. Sure. And no one knew why. But then when they started to educate the borrower on the commercial bank process, the borrower was getting up to 80% of what they asked for. Mm. So the difference is simply handling the, in, in, in it, and all relationships start with first impression. Sure. All files start with first impression, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when you get a banker, and I'm listening to you, and this is the stuff that we, we, will, we will teach to people who are open to it in leverage on how to communicate. And I say almost to the verbatim what you just said is the a good banker is a vital member of your team and you should take their input whether you do it or not is it, but at least you hear their opinion because typically they're on the conservative risk side so they are an opinion in the room you should listen to and they'll still give you the money but at least they're you know they're telling you hey have you considered this have you looked at this have you sure. you know projected for this yeah. so all of that is part of the package, but it starts with how do I communicate with the lender today in an yeah. efficient way? Because I don't have a lot of time to shop a hundred of them. 
Right. So how do I get to you and know that you're credible? And how do I get you to take interest in me in five minutes or less? Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and I love, you know, again, that, that, that mindset of, you know, how it connects people to build the relationship. You know, yes. and like you say, it, it removes barriers. And, that, and again, that's what technology should do. It, right. it just in my opinion, it, it should remove those barriers. Um, talk some, John, about today. So yeah, obviously we're in today's pandemic. Um, yeah. That's not, I don't think that's news to anybody, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, the world's been flipped and turned on its head. I would think, you know, my hunch would be, and my assumption for leverage would be, this is a great tool, particularly now, as business owners obviously are, you know, impacted by this pandemic, um, the relationship with the bank, yeah, we saw the news uh, the other day with Wells Fargo and kind yeah. of, they're kind of back to their old tricks. <laughs> um, <laughs> we go on, yep. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, there's liquidity issues for a lot of businesses that have been impacted. Um, no. Talk about how you're working today you know, John with business owners and mm. you know, how your software is a resource for people today, um, whether they're able to get, you know, kind of the, the uh, paycheck protection, you know, program sure. stuff, or if they're not, you know, talk about, you know, today's uh, impact with your, uh, with your software. Yeah. I mean, when you and I talk about, well, well let's, let me go macro for a second. Sure. We know at some point this ends. Of course. So we can, and what it takes to come out of them. Sure. But we know at some point this ends. Of course. And when we do, it's simple math. There's 30 million or so small businesses in this country. Around 22, 23 million of them. These are, I think these are Fed or, or Small Business Administration numbers. Around 22 to 23 million of them are sole proprietors. LLC owners like me, you, they have maybe one or two people working for them. The rest are outsourced. Sure. And, and that, the, the, that other eight to nine million are the larger businesses that are less than 500 employees. Sure. And that's what you saw in the paycheck protection. So there's 22 to 23 million of us out there, 20 million of us in that space use some form of bank credit. And we use that to capitalize our business for working capital to grow, to pay for things. We have some banking credit facility open. Okay. So that's a big number. Now, I think I heard somewhere is around 1.6 million businesses applied for paycheck protection in the first round. Yeah. Exactly. And you and I can do real math that's not above, we don't need an economic or finance degree to do this. If every, <laughs> if, if what, if, if a million businesses took $100,000 from that program, you know, that's a yeah. hundred million, right? Or a hundred billion. I mean, the numbers. So right. what are we going to, are we going to get to 3 million businesses who get funded? Probably. So 10% of the business population is going to get the money. Right. There's still 90% of us out there. Yeah. Right. So what are we going to do? Exactly. Right. So this is where we have to start to get proactive. So it's, it's the Churchill, right? If I can get this right. Sure. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Yes. Right. So Very we're right. all in that mode as entrepreneurs. So we're going to continue. So we need financing. We need investment in our companies because we, we have to continue. So we get faced with this horrible choice for a lot of us who are anti-debt, right? <laughs> right. Neither one of those is a happy decision, right? right. For a lot of people. But that, that's, that, that is the dynamic of surviving the recession because you're not going to get enough cash in normally or you're going to find a decrease in your revenue. Right. And we're not the government. We can print money and spend our way out. Right. Exactly. So we have to take as much government free money as we can, but when we can't get it, what do we have to do? Well, we need to find a banker that will look at us up until February. Right. Yeah. And say, well, this was your cash flow in February. And now it's June and things are getting a little better. And maybe by October, your cash flow will be back to 80% of where it was. Sure. And so I can give you this credit line. Now, my instinct is the really good bankers 
are going to rise to the top. So it's like any business, right? Of course. 20% do 80% of the business and out of that 95% do all, you know, of that 5% do all of it. So there'll only be a few, but they'll start to become known who they are and they will be the ones that now take market share because they'll see it as an opportunity to serve an actually a halfway decent group of people. Sure. So how do you present yourself to that banker? What do you do? You need to use the modern technology tools that are available to be able to get yourself ahead of the curve. And so things like leverage do come into play. Of course. Things like your accountant getting you up to date financials come into play sure. if you need them. Because it's okay that you're not making as much money as you were, mm -hmm. but what's your prognosis for when things return? Yeah. No, I mean, if I'm a landscaper today, I'm probably still doing okay. I can still work and it's seasonal and here I go, right? Yep, but exactly. if, I'm, if I'm not, if I'm in one of those really difficult classes like restaurant, that could be a really tough discussion. Sure, absolutely. But, but what if it's not? What if, the, what if you have other collateral you can work with the banker on? Yeah. You know, so you have to be, but you have to communicate quickly so that you know what the banker is going to say. So if it's, hey, this is how I looked on March 1. And you put that in the leverage report and you send it through, you say, this is how I think I'm going to look when we come out of it. You need a $50,000 credit line to survive. I didn't get PPP. Yeah. Right? Can I get it? Yes, no. Software says I can. So would you like to continue the conversation with me? If you, right. you know, it's pretty easy to attach that to a PDF, to an email and zip it around to different bankers compared to wasting all your time trying to tell your story to 50 of them. Right. No, exactly. Exactly. What do you see? And I appreciate you you taking that you know, approach to, to it. Um, and, and how I love how, you know, again, the software and that your business is tied. It's almost you know, essentially pandemic free for, for your, your standpoint, um, because you know, that again, that tie in to how it, it builds that relationship and that trust and then that communication. That's a great point as far as with the, the government assistance funding that many businesses are not going to get that. You know, of course, you know, the news came out yesterday about Ruth Chris and some of these big restaurants, you know, all getting it and now being having their feet place to the fire sure. um, as small businesses aren't getting that but now you've got large businesses in that pot um, and so I love how your software again helps you know yeah, people to continue to to have those relevant conversations John mm -hmm. um, you know without the again those barriers uh, that we talked about earlier so yeah you know, where do you see the next step of leverage um, because you know my gears are kind of spinning I see sure. I, for me I I, I one of my questions is, um, you know, the time to me, if, I, if I'm a bank, if I'm a community bank, right mm -hmm. now, take away the Wells Fargo's, the Bank of America's and all that. If I if I've got a three hundred million dollar bank and I'm in some rural area to me, I would want to have some kind of white label access to this software that I could send out, you know, I could be using my communications to my community. I'd almost want to make it part of my process, to be honest with you, because yeah. um, if that's a way that, particularly if I'm federally chartered and now I'm doing business nationwide, yep. what a great way to, again, you know, get right to the relationship building than to have the numbers there to have conversation. Yeah. So instead of me having to remember or my banker, who sometimes may be trained, may not be as the most trained, mm -hmm. having to re recall asking cash flow questions and things like that. If yeah. it's already packaged for the bank, and now you get it in and you say, "Hey, looks like John's business. Hey, that, you know that that cash flow looks good." It, it's almost the same like what you know they do in the car business, where you, you know someone's pulling their credit ahead of time and they walk in with it. Uh, from Credit Sesame or whatever, and it says yeah. seven twenty-five. And you're like, oh, yeah. let's talk to this guy. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. versus the guy that walks in and his is at five fifteen. You're like, oh, okay, go go wait line over here. But it, have but some it, popcorn. You, and but it depends, right? If, if right. that five fifteen credit score person has three hundred thousand in the bank, yes, exactly. Right? The banker wants that depositor relationship more than he wants to make the loan, as you and I use exactly. an ounce of banking, right? Right. Um, you make a great point, and this is the dialogue that occurs. So the bankers tell us, "Hey, we want to meet your people." 
Yeah. And, and so we have compatible programs, some of which are pure bank and some are non-bank because some, there's a large percentage of people who have certain issues in their file that can't do ordinary banking because they can't fit into the box. Sure. They can do non-bank lending all day. So depending upon who you are, you come into our program and you can make those decisions today. What we've, what we've, we're within a week of solving or less for, for us and our customers is the concern of where, who's lending. I mean, who is lending today and how do I fit into their box? Sure. So for a period of time, we're going to consolidate the platform that way and try to be able to give our people a source to go to that I'm comfortable can actually knows where the money is and can place them because that saves all of us as business owners running around. I'm always coming down on in favor of the business owner being one and how do I use the software and how would I want it to treat me. But once we get on the other side of this, you're so right. The community banks, today we download print and share. It's what sure. we tell our customer to do. The leverage report with the community lender. Eventually, the community lender should be in there digitally to connect to our customer. Yeah. And we have that platform and that will grow. And you're 100% right because the community banking system can be some of the, the location for some of the fairest and best credible lending sources you can find. Yeah. It's just that it's it's getting outpaced by these bigger lenders today. It's sure. changing, but it's it's still a very vibrant place to be, and I, I like it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that, and I've got ties. I work a lot with um, the ICBA and, and yeah. things like that in my profession, and I, mm-hmm. I, I think you guys should have a conversation, um, to say you know, the least, if you haven't already. It, um, well, it's um, yes, of course we have. And then when this happens, things change. Sure. So we, it, but when we come out of this, that is a wonderful organization to work with. And as you know, there's a president in each state and they know who the banks are. And it's a great way to be able to connect customers who like that personal touch versus sure. the FinTech touch. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And if I can, you know, be a, a resource in that process, I'm more than happy to, John. I've, I've got relationships there. And so uh, as you and I, you know, remain in touch, I'm, I'm happy again to, you know, well, make as many warm introductions as I can. So you know this from banking. I mean, when you, the stuff we get, I mean, I get the Christmas cards in, <laughs> you know, and it's like when people say things to you, like you've re- restored my financial dignity. I'm too humble for that. You know, but you get that in and you're like, wow, what did we just do for somebody? Oh, yeah. You know, I'll share with you a quick story. We have a, yeah. a, a guy down in, in Georgia, friend of mine, and he is a, well, I'll call him a health practitioner, but he base, he's got, you know, all these degrees next to his name. And he's a health coach. Okay. And, and so he starts his own practice and he's an anti-debt guy. He's a Ramsey guy. He doesn't like that. So he calls yeah. me up and he says, I've got an opportunity to expand. I've got the ability to serve a bunch more people who need my help, but I need more space and more staff. I need a credit line. What do I do? So we sent him the, I I took his numbers, put it into the leverage report, sent it to him. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear from him. Yeah. Four, four, three, four months go by. I get a text. Okay. The text comes in, you know, you open your text. Right. And it says, my fat pants are loose. (laughs) <laughs> now this guy is is one of these guys he's got like a 30 inch waist i mean he is ripped he's in his 50s right. and he's got the he's got the washboard enviable right right and right i'm like right. what i'm like what are you talking so then i gotta call him i'm like what are you talking about yeah and he says oh i'm sorry that was a forwarded text from a client i've cured her of diabetes she's wow. losing weight that's what she sent to me i took your software i went down to the bank said what you said got my credit line expanded my practice and I wanted you guys to know that your software is changing people's lives. Wow. I mean, right. And there you yeah. sit wow. and you go, wow. So now when that happened, you know, a little while ago, so you say, well, now it's my job, right. To get it out there to everybody mm-hmm. because it's not my job to keep it in house and just let a few people use it. Right. I have to, now I need to get it to everybody because the more people that can be helped in their business and in their life and in their ability to feel financially capable of doing a transaction when they weren't before because of fear holding them back or uncertainty, 
it's my job to get it out there. So somebody like you saying, hey, I'll help you do that. That's what it's about for me. I mean, this is great because it's like the more people we can help, the better we are. Yeah. And and those are one of the things that always attracted me to to that is is those stories like that, John, the stories of, you know, again, it's kind of like the hockey assist, you know, you do this, but it leads to a score even yep. though it didn't come from your direct past, but it was your past yep. that allowed the business owner to get in position and, and maybe something else opens up that then ultimately there's a score and then there's this trifecta of wins um, yeah. that are experienced. And and some things, you know, you may not ever hear about. You may not, that story may not get back to you. How a business owner is then able to go in and take care of a community or of a customer or you know retain a job or hire someone who's been out of work and has been struggling and is on their last leg and all of a sudden they get a call from the business owner that hey can you start monday and now you think about that does for a family i mean there's right. 22 million people right now john out of work as of the recording of this podcast Yep. You no, know, I mean it, it's it's crazy out here, and and just to think, you know, I, I listen to that story as, you know, someone that's a former banker, and it's like, you know, that's why you do it, man. That's right. You know, that's what it should be about. You know, like you said earlier, it shouldn't be about just making money. It should be about what are you doing that's edifying the community, and then that's edifying your family, and then yourself. Right. Um, right. And that so that's tremendous. Yeah, and if you can make that kind of impression and help those kind of people that way, what else can it? What else can you do in your day? Yeah, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, as we talked about, you mentioned your wife earlier, John. And yeah. course, you know, my wife, she's in uh, the pharmacy business, and uh, she's out on the front line. She's at a, a private clinic, so she's out, out helping people every yep. day and that sort of thing. And there are a lot of people, again, that are out there that are, are doing that. Um, but talk about the importance of family for you personally and for your business. Sure. Sure. So it's what starts everything in the course of the day for most of us, right? I mean, you get up in the morning, you go to work. I have, it's funny because I've heard you talk about the age of your children yeah. before. So I'm just the next level, right? Okay. Mine are 25, 23, and 21. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, my, my, Sports car, yacht, and beach house all went to particular financial instit- or uh, higher education, you know, institutions. <laughs> right for all right. of them. Um, I was um, one of the greatest things, though, is my oldest went to the Marine Corps. Okay. And um, he put in his four years, and he did fantastic. Yeah. And so then he came home, and he came right into the development business with me. Awesome. And I'll tell you what, the skills that are learned in the military that get applied to business are fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, when, when he went, he was a different person than when he came back. And nobody puts in the day's work he does. It's fantastic. So when you start to surround your, you start to put your kids and, and your family in the business, the responsibilities now are even more acute because yeah. you have to keep things moving for everybody. Oh, right? you keep, it's, it's so it becomes even more of a responsibility. So that's when you really are studying your business and making sure that you can get through things. And then here we are, recession four for me, there you right? And, and what's the plan to survive? And it's capitalized. It's, I use the software the same way as our customers. It's like you capitalize to get through it because you have to be confident that you can return the capital when it gets better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's but no, it it all starts with family, and it all it all the it, there's nothing better at the end of the day when you're done and you go home and you can just sit down with your wife and you can just hang out and talk about the day and decompress from it, right? Yeah, it's fantastic. It's yeah. you're lucky. I'm lucky to have somebody like that. There you go. And I, I, I share that uh, sentiment as well, John. I, I'm very fortunate uh, with my wife to be able to do that as well, in all seriousness. And, yeah. and that's what makes uh, it definitely is. It's what makes things go round for sure. It least, does. To say the least. Um, yeah. John, as we, we start to wrap up, because I mean, you shared phenomenal content today. And um, you know, what are some of your best practices for success? Um, you know, for you because, that you would share with others. What are, what are you know what are two things that have worked for you, John, that others can emulate and, and go be successful? You'll know, say tomorrow. Sure. So you know, my kids would have to listen to this. You know, the old Roy <laughs> Rogers, right? Even if you're sure. on the right track, 
if you or or Will Rogers. Even if you're on the right track, if you don't keep moving, you're gonna get hit by the train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, so you need to keep, copyright that one. Yeah. I mean, business people keep moving. Yeah. You know, it's um in and you know, what did Babe Ruth say? Yesterday's home runs don't win the game today. Right. Right. So I mean, you keep moving, you can't rest on what you did yesterday. You have to keep moving. And by right. keep moving, it's just keep talking to people, keep networking, keep going. I mean, so many people, I think, get to the point where they're so close to success and then they'll stop. Yeah. And they were they were right there and they right. stopped. And so there's so many, you know, those are the sad failures that shouldn't happen. Just, yeah. you know, this pandemic, all of it, stay healthy first, help where you can, right? But, but you have to keep moving. You yep, can't exactly. stop. You can't just get petrified and panicked and just 24 seven news cycle and wait for everybody else to do something, right? Keep right. moving, it's so yep. important. Yep, it certainly is. I, I mm. echo that uh, 100%, John. John Matheson, our, our guest today with Leverage. Um, go to leveragecalc.com, MYB. So MYB community, I want everybody to do this. Go to Leverage Calc, that's L-E-V-E-R-A-G-E-C-A-L-C.com. Do that uh, today. When you're done listening to this episode, go check it out. You know, play around with the software. Reach out to John. Um, you can email John, john at leveragecalc.com. Email him, let mm-hmm. him know that you heard him and you enjoyed him right here on the Minding Your Business podcast. Podcast and and support him by sharing, um, you know this. If you if you know business owners, you know people there in your community um, that may be struggling and they may not get the the lending and the financing uh, from a federal level. Um, there's still many banks that would love to do business with them, and so this is a great way to help them prepare and help them build that relationship. So if you care about local business or if you're a local business owner, of course. Uh, you know, listening to this podcast, uh, definitely make sure you check out, uh, you know, that. And, and again, reach out to John, share, you know, your, your thoughts, um, good, bad, or ugly. What do you think? Say, share your ideas, things like that. So that just helps us all build and, and can help John and his team um, understand what's going on out there in the field and they can make adjustments, but they can only do that if they hear from all of us. So, you know, that's one of the purposes of this podcast is to bring folks like this uh you know, that you can hear from, and then ultimately that you can go and then support in whatever way that that takes shape. And so, John, I, I can't thank you enough, man, for, you know, one, taking time to be here on the podcast, um, to share your background and to share the passion around you have for your business being a community edifier. I salute you for that. Um, shout out to you personally and professionally. Stay safe. And you know, I definitely want to be in touch because I think there's um, you know, some overlap in some things that I'm doing um, and some folks that you know, want to introduce you to um, that I think you know, could be beneficial Terrific. Um, and just be good resources of anything. Well, that's what we're here. We're here to help. And you, know, you are an amazing ambassador for the community. For business people, the community, I, I listen to what you do. Your podcast is just a fantastic way to spread information to people, and I salute you for doing it. Yeah, man, those are kind words from you, John. I really appreciate that, uh, you saying that. Um, again, best wishes to you, my man. Keep having fun. Keep doing what you're doing. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get all through this, and then, um, you know, I'll be able to make it up there, hopefully. And, and hey, we'll shake hands and eat at a we'll local restaurant. <laughs> Imagine that. What's that like? <laughs> yep, exactly. So, John, listen, thank you again, my man. Thank you. Um, you know, again, best wishes to you and your family, and we'll talk again you soon. Too. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks, John. Great. All right. Awesome. All right. So that was John Matheson. Check him out. Uh, Email him, john at leveragecalc.com. And then also go to leveragecalc.com. That'll be in the show notes uh, here for you, MYB. Uh, Just a great guy, great hearted guy doing uh, great things, um, you know, all around the country. And, and again, helping that relationship between banker and business owner. Uh, which is uber critical in today's time and then even beyond. So Champ Ron, the Mind of Your Business podcast, uh, subscribe, five star, five star on Apple helps us connect with uh, more people interested in great content. Of course, we are powered by the Binge Podcast Network. Shout out to everyone that's on uh, the Binge Podcast Network. 
if you'd love for me to help you launch your podcast, Brand Pod, Your Brand's Voice Amplified, visit me at brandyourpod.com. It's brandyourpod.com, working with businesses, individual brands to help you launch the type of podcast and podcast platform that'll be great for you to connect to your target audience. Your target audience may not all be on your social media pages. They may not be uh, where you're sending out flyers or your TV and radio, but as many people are at home, they have their devices and they are listening to podcasts. Podcast streaming has increased significantly even just since um, the stay at home orders and, and things like that. So reach out to me, uh, go to brandyourpod.com. Uh, we can do a quick, um, you know, kind of uh, discovery uh, call uh, via Zoom, and I can share with you uh, specific ways on how you can launch uh, your podcast platform, which will be totally yours, and you'll own your content, which you don't have when it's on social media. They own the content uh, once you post it on social media, but you can own your content and own your narrative and then tell your story of yourself and your brand. Champ Ron, the Mind Your Business podcast. Check us out also at themybpodcast.com. Be great, and I'll see you next time.